we've got two PGY3s giving uh, great talks today. Um, first, Chris Ricks is going to be telling us about a new presentation of a uh, common retinal scar. And um, I believe we have sort of a guest there as part of that presentation, so that would be great. Um, and secondly, Lee Ferguson, another PGY3, is going to be talking to us about managing leaky vessels. So my name is Christopher Ricks, I'm one of the PGY3s, and uh, I just want to start off my presentation with a quote from one of the great authors, actually an actor playing one of the great authors of all time. Uh, Every story ever told can be broken down into three parts, the beginning, the middle, and the twist. A little teaser there for you. So July 2017, beginning, 39-year-old man presented with blurry vision in the right eye, uh, saying, you know, I hit my head a few days ago and since then, uh, it's been blurry. He's born in Guatemala, hasn't been back in a few years, no past medical history. Uh, says blurriness is worsening, especially the superior half of the vision. Um, denies any direct trauma to the eye itself, no previous eye problems. Uh, and the injury, you know, he had a, a little bump on his head, but other than that, didn't lose consciousness, was pretty mild uh, in nature. So we did a social history and review systems. Uh, he works with chemicals in a, at work in a biohazard suit uh, since starting that job. <coughs> He's lost about 10 pounds. Um, it's been about three months, non-intentional. He attributed that to uh, just working in a, a plastic suit, sweating a lot, working hard. Um, he ha does say he's had bloody stools for the past three weeks. Denies any shortness of breath, night sweats, fever, chills, pain. Um, denies any IV drug use, risky sexual behavior, sick contacts. Uh, no recent travel, no family history of cancer, eye problems. Does have a family history of diabetes. So on the exam that day, vision is decreased in the right eye, 2070. Uh, on exam, you can see he had a little bit of cell in his vitreous, which was concerning. Uh, and his dilated exam showed this, uh, this lesion uh, along the inferior arcade um, that uh, looked like it had some swelling, um, possibly an overlying rupture of Brooks' memory. You can see that lesion here. Um, so, you know, kind of a different presentation than what we expected when someone coming in with half of their vision lost after a bump to the head. You can see here's the, a black and white photo kind of helping delineate the margins of that lesion. Also got an OCT, a few things to point out. You can see the fluid underneath the retina here. And then also these little white spots above the retina, which in, usually indicates some, some vitreous cell. So a, a physical exam was done briefly. Uh, and the only thing positive was is that he had these white plaques in his mucous membranes, which were, which were concerning. Other than that, pretty normal physical exam. So at this point, you know, coming from a, a working differential diagnosis. So vascular causes. Uh, occlusions, rams, uh, inflammation, sarcoid vasculitis, CSR, he's a young male, uh, CNVM. Infection was really high on our list because of the unilateral nature of his presentation and uh, the overlying vitreous cells. Although that doesn't necessarily indicate it has to be infectious. Um, malignancy is also high on our differential based on his, um, his weight loss and his, uh, his bloody stools. And then we couldn't totally rule out trauma because that was what his chief complaint was. So we asked the uh, Keep going. Yep, sorry. Um, this was concerning enough that we decided to ask the internal medicine department to admit him for us so we could do a really expedited formal workup. Uh, so we got a lot of testing, HIV, RPR, a lot of the usual uveitis, infectious disease type workups, workups that we do, as well as some imaging. Uh, came back with some interesting positives. HIV was positive. Um, a lot of negatives, but he also had pancytopenia. Uh, some elevated liver enzymes and, and elevated ESR. And then CMV was positive in the blood, which you know, pushes us farther and farther towards that differential uh, in the infectious disease. Um, I want to point out one thing on our differential, you know, this something else category. This is kind of rising higher and higher with his presentation. So we got a chest x-ray that turned out to be totally normal. Uh, we got an MRI which turned out to be totally not normal. You can see here, this is not something you expect to see. This would be considered a quote unquote ring enhancing lesion, which brings to mind a few uh, possibilities that uh, a lot of us remember from our board exam days. So we decided to do a vitreous tap, uh, inject phoscarnate, clindamycin, sent a lot of labs out to the University of Washington as well as to our own lab here to try to find out what is this exactly. Uh, interesting things came back. So uh, toxoplasmosis came back. Uh, IgG positive, uh, CMV came back negative, which you know sometimes we'd expect to see that in an HIV positive patient. Um, everything else came back negative, and a CD4 
count came back very, very, very low, 24. Uh, just a quick review on what the diagnostic criteria for AIDS is. Um, this is the one we're really paying attention to right here. So uh, CD4 count of less than 200 or some AIDS-defining condition, and there's a whole host of different uh, infectious etiologies that uh, count in that category. So continue kind of watching him, working him up while he's inpatient for the next few days. You can see an FA here uh, showing some early leakage and then towards the end some late pooling, uh, helping again to just see how big and extensive this lesion is. So five days later, vision had decreased after our, our treatment um, with a tap and inject to 2150. You can see it's actually starting to look a little bit better. It's starting to flatten out. You can see the OCT indicates that some of that fluid's gone away, not quite as much cell in the vitreous. Uh, six weeks later, vision was improving, 2060 uh, in that eye, still again looking better. Um, three months later, still more and more improvement. Uh, he did have a bit of a hiccup about four months after his presentation, which was two weeks ago, he developed this subretinal fluid or subretinal hemorrhage. Um, vision had dropped it to count fingers at five feet. So a pneumatic displacement of the blood was performed in clinic. Uh, Avastin was injected, TPA was injected. Post op day one, he improved to 2200. And uh, post op day seven, just a couple days ago, was down to 2025. So now the twist. He followed up with ID after his discharge, and uh, the notes indicated Mr. B, aka Mr. L, is a 39 year old Hispanic male known to the ID service from his previous inpatient stay at the, uh, at the University of Utah. And he presented using a different name than they had documented. The attending who had seen him said, hey, wait a minute, I know you. I'd seen you back in 2013. <clears throat> he had had a previous diagnosis of HIV uh, and had been very well controlled, um, but had been lost to follow up due to social and insurance issues. So he used a different name, denied any previous medical history. Uh, throughout his entire two-week admission, never once admitting that he'd already been diagnosed and already been treated uh, in the past. Um, the CD4 count when he was last seen was one, 167, uh, while on heart and he was you know, pretty well controlled at that time. So to talk about toxoplasmosis here, uh, you can see these are some of the more typical lesions we see when we think of toxoplasmosis. We think of an old scar with some active inflammation next to it. Um, the lesion we saw, you know, it looked just like the active inflammation part, no scar, because this was a new presentation indicated by the IgG was positive versus the IgM was not. So for the treatment of toxoplasmosis, there's a, a variety of ways we can treat this. Um, with immunocompetent individuals, as long as the macula is not involved, it's often okay just to observe this. Uh, but if we are going to treat, then we kind of talk about this classic or triple therapy, which is pyrimethamine, uh, sulfadiazine, and then systemic corticosteroids if they're immunocompetent. It's important to emphasize the immunocompetent part. In this patient, if he had been treated with steroids without that MRI being done, um, you know, he has you know, this cyst or abscess in his brain, which would not respond well to steroids, as we can all imagine. Um, this triple therapy is oftentimes complicated by numerous side effects. Um, GI dermatologic, we always have to monitor for leukopenia, thrombocytopenia. Um, it's not a benign treatment. so. Usually if there's not a perfect treatment, there's lots of other options that we can try as well. Uh, some of the other common ones are trimethoprim and sulfa, <coughs> excuse me, sulfamethoxazole, um, plus or minus, again, systemic steroids. Um, clindamycin, uh, often added as part of the quadruple therapy to the classic triple therapy. Um, for local infections, we can use clindamycin injected intravitrally as, long, as well as dex dexamethasone, but important to remember that has no systemic benefit to the patient, just local. Uh, atovaquin, and then one of the newer treatments is this uh, azithromycin and pyrimethamine. It uh, has really good response, although it does have a higher occurrence. It's been shown to be a, a non-inferior treatment, so that's something that um, is always a good thing to consider. We asked one of our infectious disease colleagues, Dr. Thronberry, to, to you know add a little bit to <clears throat> things we need to think about when uh, treating patients with systemic toxoplasmosis in immunocompetent and immunocompromised patients. Thanks, Christopher. Um, I'm Kyle Thrombery. I'm one of the first-year ID fellows here. Um, I've been following this guy in clinic, so I'm pretty familiar with him. Um, I appreciate the presentation and the kind of the social aspect. We see a fair amount of these patients. Um, I think the big teaching point for me in this case, uh, where I went to medical school, the, one of the hospitals we worked at was a county hospital, and uh, patients 
um, with um, toxoplasmosis, encephalitis, et cetera, uh, usually get treated with Bactrim um, at high doses. And um, in the, if you read the CDC guidelines, um, that's actually pretty common in low resource settings. Uh, the thing I learned here is actually, I was initially told by the, the medicine team that um, the patient couldn't afford the pyrimethamine component. Um, but actually, uh, it, found, so it turns out our, our hospital will pay for these, for the classic regimen. So this guy doesn't have any funding, but they were happy to pay for six weeks of this. Um, and then um, up to 30 to 40% of patients who get started on the classic uh, regimen have to go off of it, usually for intolerance reasons. And um, in his case, he got the full six weeks of kind of the induction acute treatment um, and was having a lot of nausea and uh, even a little bit of vomiting. And was also just having kind of a lag in his uh, CD4 count coming up, which we were attributing to the bone marrow suppression from the regimen. So we, he's on uh, Bactrim now as kind of part of the long-term phase. And usually we treat these people for quite a long time because recurrence rates are quite high. And so he'll be on kind of a higher dose of Bactrim probably for at least a year or so. It just depends on how, how high the CD4, come, CD4 count comes up. Usually you like to see it above a, uh, 200 for about half a year. Um, I, think, I think that's all, all I have to add. He's at, globally, this guy is doing pretty well in our clinic, um, and just kind of dealing with some social issues ongoing, but overall doing well. His CD4 counts come up and he's responded to ART. So. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh -huh. um, a lot of our uh, patients with paramacular lesions, we tend to leave them on back to, uh, at the same dose as you would put it uh, you know, for a PCP prophylaxis, mm -hmm. just Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three times a week. Mm -hmm. uh, is this something that would be acceptable to your guys? So if you read um, either one, the CDC guidelines, or if you read into uh, Mandel, which is just kind of like all expert opinion, but they do have literature cited. Usually, um, until their CD4 count comes up above 200 for six months, <coughs> their recommendation is uh, one double strength BID. BID. Yeah, so it's a much higher dose than like, the say, the, the PGAP prophylaxis dose. Yeah. So he'll be on a high. I think he's on. Our, our guy is on uh, one double strength BID right now. And, and again, thank you for coming. Yeah. So I realize you don't have years of experience in infectious disease. Yes. But um, for, uh, for residents, con consulting services, mm -hmm. um, or attendings that are staff and consulting services, are there specific uh, tips, anything in particular you, you like or don't like from consulting services on volume? Fine if there's nothing huh. perfect. I just I just want to make sure that for the residents in particular, we're giving you what you want on the console. No, no. I, I actually I feel like um, especially of all like the surgical services, ophthalmology has a more of a, a tendency to do really good workups and be thorough and um, really get in contact with us early on and ask ask for our input. And so I appreciate that a lot. Um, I've had a few patients, not just this guy, but over at Huntsman especially with you know and optimitis and things like that. And I feel like um, there's good communication and I definitely appreciate that. I, yeah, no, no uh, recommendations or anything. No, thanks for having me. You mentioned oh, go ahead. using bathroom in your, I guess, residency in a lower resource setting. Yeah. But it, it costs not an issue. Like, um, I guess, does it sound like you're recommending against using <coughs> bathroom as first line? If, if you so, Good question, and I looked into this when there was one of the, um, I think one of the uveitis fellows or something had an epic message me about this exact question. So I had looked into it a little bit. Um, so it, all, pretty much all the resources, including CDC, recommend the classic three drug regimen. Um, and that's mostly, from what I can tell, based on experience and uh, kind of the summary of all the data they have. And so usually if you can get the drug um, or the drugs, they recommend using that, that uh, preferred regimen. And then um, if, if paramethamine is not available, then usually a lot of resources recommend Bactrim alone. But like I was saying here, I, I found out they'll, uh, the hospital will pay for it, which is nice. Um, so. In ophthalmology, does, 
data to support using triple therapy, um, or at least classic therapy, can decrease your uh, rate of recurrence mm -hmm. and uh, be more likely to remit it. I don't know, I'm just not sure what you're saying. Yeah, there's, there's a few. Uh, they're all they're all from Europe, but there's a few. Um, there's an Italian study and I think a Spanish study that showed that cyst for cyst well for encephalitis, for example, um, Bactrim is non inferior, um, but that a uh, limited amount of patients. And I think there's a there's a few um, ophthalmology papers that one of them I read. Um, it actually compared a, a substandard dose of this regimen to Bactrim, and it was Bactrim was not inferior, but of course it was not the typical dose that we use. But <clears throat> thanks, everybody. Thank you. Definitely was. <laughs> I agree. Um, so unfortunately, you have me for about three more minutes. Um, <laughs> one thing that I, I failed to point out too, when uh, we got those antibodies back, you have to always remember someone who's. Uh, immune system is compromised, you can't really trust what those antibodies tell you um, because they may be positive and they might have disease or it just becomes a much less a sensitive and specific test. Um, and then uh, kind of the other component to this gentleman's case was uh, the fact that we had no idea what his past medical issue was because he didn't tell us we didn't have the right identification on him. Um, so why do these patients do this? Um, you know, Usually they're not just trying to trick us for the sake of tricking us. There's usually a good reason for it. Um, this gentleman's complicated immigration status, legal concerns. Um, you know, this patient had come in with a, a disability claim with the disability people at his side. So he'd probably been using his work. The name he gave us was probably the name he'd used at work. Um, that might have caused him to just give us that name initially. Um, you know, workers comp, uh, lack of insurance. Oftentimes uh, when I was in medical school, we had a lot of patients that would come in using the same name and birthday and had, you know, we'd look at their notes and it didn't make any sense because there'd be 50 people using that exact same name because they knew that name was insured um, and was a legal uh, citizen so they could get health care. Um, and then also hiding previous medical issues. People sometimes are, are embarrassed. There are certain diagnoses out there that have a, a strong stigma. Uh, I was able to get some papers from uh, Lisa and or Dr. Ord and Amy about, uh, you know, the prevalence of people avoiding the diagnosis of HIV, avoiding admitting to it because of the stigma that comes along with it, uh, and then just denying the fact that they're sick. Oftentimes patients will say, well, you know, my viral load is undetectable, therefore I'm not HIV positive, so they don't want to endorse that they have this disease because, you know, in their mind it wasn't positive. Um, so the, the other half of this is how can we help these people? Because these patients still need health care and they still need us to, to take care of them. Uh, it's easy to become very angry with them and say, you know, we just spent two weeks working you up for a disease you already knew you had. Um, why didn't you just tell us? But that doesn't help them and it doesn't really help us either. Um, so during the exam, you know, important to keep an open mind. If the chief complaint and the exam findings don't match, you know, that should raise red flags. Um, working with the social work team, they're always available to help us. Um, we need to be careful not to scare them away and you know, accuse them and confront them in a negative way because uh, that could scare them away and then we have a patient in this case uh, who's been HIV positive for many years untreated possibly you know, causing other people to become infected. Um, it's important always to seek to understand why they're doing this. Uh, as physicians we need to really emphasize the importance of empathy. Um, there's always a reason. People are usually doing it because they think uh, this is going to be the best situation for them it's the best they know how. Um, we should always address it with that in mind um, until we have absolute proof that they are you know, doing something malicious. Um, and then just make sure we continue to provide the best medical care possible. Uh, and then he, uh, Dr. Thronberry mentioned this Ryan White program just briefly. It's a program uh, that was started after this, this uh, boy, Ryan White, after a blood infusion, a blood transplant, um, developed H, uh, became HIV positive and died. Uh, so his family helped uh, push for litigation, or, uh, um, legal changes that allowed uh, this fund to be created for patients to get treated, for the families of the patients, uh, research for HIV positive individuals, uh, but it does require them to follow up regularly. Uh, there are certain requirements that they have to maintain to stick with the program. Um, any other questions or comments? Dr. Thronberry, Dr. Shapur, myself, or our social work team? <coughs>